New York City, the largest and most international city in the United States. A multicultural place that has always been a melting pot for people from all over the world. The Statue of Liberty sits in the harbor, beckoning the poor, the hungry, and the oppressed. Host city to the United Nations, the most serious attempt in the history of mankind to maintain peace. Where Kennedy and Castro, Arafat and Begin, all can have their say from the same podium. A city where commerce and trade have flourished for over 300 years. The advertising capital of the world, a leader in art, style, and internationally renowned for its architecture. An open city that is a mecca to those who love music, dance, and the theater. A bastion of free thought, ideas, and opinion. But an open city is also a vulnerable city, vulnerable to the criminals who reside both here and elsewhere. Such is the price her citizens pay to live and work in this pinnacle city of the Western Hemisphere. The World Trade Towers are one of the many places that New Yorkers work and tourists flock to. Built in the late 60s and early 70s, these two huge office towers employ upwards of 50,000 people, and as many as 80,000 visitors arrive each day to view the harbor from the tower's two lofty heights. Beneath these towers, both subway and commuter trains run into large stations. Between them lies the 22-story Vista Hotel. On February 26th, the worlds of commerce and trade collided with that of confusion and terrorism when, at 12.18 p.m. I was on house watch uh, when the explosion came, came across and uh, it was very loud and the whole house shook and I proceeded to call the dispatch and tell them uh, that we thought we had a manhole blown on Western Liberty and then uh, we, we all, everyone came to the front and we all left quarters and proceeded down to Western Liberty, and uh, we saw, we didn't know what we had. We had, saw people looking down the street, and as we turned the corner, we saw smoke pushing out of the parking garage. After we pulled up in front of the uh, building, we didn't realize exactly what we had. We had numerous reports of uh, people trapped, people injured. So what I did was I split my company in, in two. I sent one team into the uh, garage level through the uh, exit ramp. The other team I took with me into the building itself, down to the B2 level. We conducted a primary search down there. The rubble was absolutely amazing. In 15 years as a firefighter, I've never seen such destruction in my life. As we proceeded over to the scene, we were responding southbound on West Street. When we were hailed down near Vestry Street by the Port Authority Police Department, they informed us that a explosion had just occurred on the B2 level and there were numerous victims still down in the garage. I directed all members of the unit, including the chauffeur, to come down the ramp into the garage area. As we entered, we encountered a heavy smoke condition with debris still falling. The floor seemed to have exploded down and collapsed into the level below that. And when we got down there, we got down about, I would say, three, four hundred feet in. Uh, we were met by a man coming out, uh, severely injured. I don't know how he lived. I don't know how he lived. Where was he coming from? I don't know. <laughs> Anybody else down there? Uh, I don't know. But they just, we pulled another guy out later on. Seven engine pulled a man out later on, and it's still searching. And that was pretty smoky and... and uh... It was really nasty. A lot of cars on fire. A lot of steam pipes exploded and broke. A lot of walls collapsed down. It was a mess. But our captain, which was good, he gave us quick, concise orders. Very clearly, he wanted to... We knew exactly what he wanted and what we had to do by the way he gave us our orders. So we... Eventually, we got a line down into the cellar, and the, the devastation it was apparent that uh, there was something large exploded. That decision to stretch from the apparatus was probably, in my mind, one of the most important decisions made that day, because because of the uh, explosion, the standpipe system was out of service. It was inoperable. 
So since we're separate from the building, we're stretching from the apparatus, we got water on the fire probably less than 10 minutes after the explosion. Uh, just getting the line of position before we charged it was a, a, a task in itself due to the conditions. When we finally did get the uh, line in place and water was started, we had to operate at this position for quite a while due to the volume of the fire. However, we knew that the fire had to be put out because of the uh, civilians, and uh, we pressed onward. We had stretched the first line with six engine, and uh, after we got them into, into place, which was basically towards the, the one edge of the crater, we went back up and we stretched the second line. We brought that down and we veered off to the right side of the crater and the six engine had gone to the left. And we were going from car fire to car fire to car fire, going through all kinds of wreckage, um, and just trying to put the fire out as best as possible and continue in. Uh, we had one truck assisting us, stretching the line in to a point while they were making a search. And we had the fire just burning from the top sides of the crater all around it to inside the crater all along the walls. And uh, we made our way to the far end of the crater and we were putting the fire out. We were darkening the fire down and the officers decided to pull everybody back to regroup and to reassess the attack onto the uh, different areas of fire. As I shut the line down, I started to draw back with the line. I heard a moan over to my right and I guess it was approximately about 20, 25 feet to my right along the edge of the crater that there was a, a gentleman underneath uh, some downed live electrical conduit between two cars that were crushed right down to the seats. And Lieutenant Brown and myself, we had a crawl doing reduced profile underneath the live electrical conduit to reach the gentleman that was in between the two cars. We were one of the first companies to arrive at the scene. <clears throat> so, uh, we had to park the rig, don our gear, and uh, proceed by foot into this garage. Uh, we had to cross in several hundred yards, and it was totally pitch black. Uh, and as we came further in, we see overturned cars and uh, uh, busted out walls and ceilings. Uh, cars were, were uh, the lights were on, courtesy lights were on, uh, burglar alarms were going on the cars, and there were all these signs of life, yet there was nobody down there. And as soon as we got down to the bottom of the stairs, where the fellow directed us, the people were trapped. We came upon an office area, it was one floor down. I believe it was the B1 level. So we were searching the B1 level, and small office area, and then like a uh, locker area. Went through the locker area and some bathrooms. Uh, lockers were all blown over on their sides, like rows of dominoes. Uh, we were searching through some lockers. The company had split up, and then Lieutenant McAllister called to us that he had heard a victim through this one area. I heard this man calling out, <clears throat> and it was just very strange. It was like this haunting dream. Uh, it, was, it was like being in hell, and you saw fire on all the different levels. I felt some uh, uh, crumbled concrete under my feet, and it felt like the floor was going up a little bit. And it was the first glimpses of orange I got through the smoke. I stopped, uh, turned to Gary to talk to him, I uh, meant to tell him uh, that I thought some of the concrete was spalling off the ceiling above us. I could see some orange. I was going to tell him I think we need a line. And just as I stopped, I started to fall through uh, what I was standing on. I reached for Gary, and we had each other by the hand for a minute, pulled out. Uh, stopped for a second, grabbed some uh, reinforcing rod as it came by where my chest was. Uh, Gary laid on the ground, tried to grab me. I slid another put a two on the wire, wire again, a reinforcing rebar again. Guy reached again, couldn't reach me, and then uh, I fell through. And all of a sudden I saw the orange go uh, right by me. I uh, fell past the fire, and uh, I just kept falling. I heard the man's cries for help, and I was trying to look from with my flashlight, uh, but I couldn't see him. And, um, when, when you saw this rubble, it, it was just so, uh, this whole scene was so intense, and you're afraid to walk out on the rubble because it was like one piece was holding up the next, 
and uh, you didn't know if it would hold you, you didn't know if the ceiling was going to come down on you, because there was a gigantic slab that had to weigh at least a ton, and it was hanging by a thread from the ceiling. But while I was there uh, uh, trying to must up the nerve to go out and get him, uh, Captain Settle comes up from behind uh, with 18 engine. And I say, well, there's a man out here, and I can't see him, I can hear him. His voice is clear. He can't be buried too deeply, but I don't know where he is. So he says, well, we have to get him. So he drops his mask and proceeds out on these pipes. Uh, the man just displayed raw courage. It, it was, uh, you know, it was quite incredible. And, uh, and I said to myself, well, I got to go out now because he, he's out there. Uh, I took my mask just in case we needed some air. And uh, he found the man about 30 feet out just beyond this concrete slab that had uh, pieces of rebar jutting out. And uh, I went out to join him. And uh, he went down in this kind of valley that was formed from the concrete slabs. And uh, I straddled that piece of concrete and held on to, to a piece of rebar and reached down and grabbed the man's arm as the captain was pushing him up from behind. And his leg, the man's leg, his ankle was broken, his, uh, his other leg was broken in a couple of spots, and his hip was broken. Um, we get him to the top of the concrete, and he was a heavy guy, he was about 240 pounds. Um, and not having the use of his legs, naturally, it was dead weight. It was very difficult to get a, a footing to push off to, um, to, to, to make the load easier. So it was a very difficult uh, removal operation. Uh, at which point the EMS had arrived and uh, somebody brought a, a wooden stepladder and we secured him to the wooden stepladder and uh, used an axe as a splint. Anyhow, we, we transported him to a golf cart which the EMS was using uh, since they couldn't get their vehicle down there. Uh, got him onto the, <coughs> excuse me, the back of the golf cart and, um, and then they removed him. And then we had to go back in and get Kevin Shea, who had fallen from the B1 level uh, on the side opposite where this man had fallen. Uh, I just kept falling. I, I, I had expected to hit, you know, fall for a second to hit. I just kept falling. I didn't hit. Then when I did hit, uh, uh, it was like feet first, then knees, then face, hit a wall, and then I fell. I laid on my back. Uh, when I tried to move, the first time I tried to move, I tried yanking myself up, and I couldn't move. And the first thing was there was reinforcing rods sticking out uh, both sides of me, I could see. And um, I, at first, I was afraid I was impaled, because uh, I, I tried to move, and I couldn't move, and I saw the bar sticking up. So you know, your first reaction is you're afraid to look. Uh, gave May Day, you know, it's May Day, May Day, uh, rescue one, I fell, I don't know where I am. Uh, that didn't get answered. Uh, realized nothing was stuck there, and I was I had a lot of heat on my side, and my shoulder was burned. And I, I looked, I saw a big piece of machinery. It was apparently it ended up turned out to be cars, a couple of cars mangled, and these cars were so unrecognizable. I didn't even see a single wheel, window, nothing. That told me it was a car, and uh, I heard a, a big boom. There was a loud boom, and I felt something smack my face. Uh, I turned slowly to see what it was, and a big chunk of uh, cinder block with concrete mixed together fell down and smashed my hand light when that was within reach. So I was real anxious to get away from where I was. Uh, I could see horizontally 10, 20 feet, uh, maybe 20 feet, uh, but I couldn't see up more than seven or eight feet. Smoke was going up, but it wasn't lifting. Uh, and the fires around me lit the area up pretty well, so I could see good. Uh, I kept hearing boom, boom, as concrete and cinder blocks were falling from all over, and I couldn't see where they were coming from because the smoke was, was too, uh, too low. It was only about seven or eight feet, and the stuff was just dropping through it, so you couldn't see which direction to crawl to. I uh, tried to pull myself up like a dual pull-up, and to climb up the debris, I figured I could just drag my legs underneath me and uh, I made one pull-up attempt, and uh, the bone through the boot uh, caught on debris, and uh, that was it, and the pain was too much. Uh, I fell back down, uh, unhooked my knee from, where I, from the debris. 
Uh, another, uh, another thing that they did for me, which was great, was I kept telling them on the radio, I got fire all around me, and one, which fire was growing, you know, the one to my right in front of me was growing. Uh, I can't get away from that one anymore, because I called as far as I could, and they, I didn't realize they were getting all my communications, or a lot of them. I thought, because I couldn't hear them, I thought they couldn't hear me. And the next thing I knew, uh, from different floors above me in different distances, but where you couldn't see through the debris, hose lines start operating over my head, crisscross, and that was fantastic to see, because I knew they must be hearing what I'm saying. And uh, from one side, uh, just a heavy caliber stream must have been two and a half crossed over and started to keep a fire away from me on my other side, my right side. And then the lines were, you could uh, hear them and feel the water banging off debris, but the lines were crisscrossing over my head and keeping fire away from me. So it was a real uh, uh, coordinated effort to, you know, to get me out of there. And uh, a lot of work went into it before uh, the guys reached me and then John Fox reached me and Jack Ty a few minutes later and guys, uh, Timmy Kelly and Gary Geidel were tunneling through from another direction. Uh, I guess guys were reaching me from all over. And that was, uh, that was about it, just a uh, lucky day. Well, it wasn't my day, yeah. As firefighters in the hole battled to extinguish fires and rescue victims, a battle of a different sort was shaping up outside. Arriving chiefs were beginning to realize the enormity of the problems that faced them. Smoke from dozens of car fires was pouring up from the crater into the Vista Hotel and the Trade Towers, posing a lethal threat to tens of thousands of people. The largest command and control operation in the history of the fire department was just beginning. All right, Manhattan, still coming in. Go ahead, Phil, come. All right, Manhattan, uh, keep this minute. Uh, another third alarm for you. Just that second alarm on box 100. Okay, I have a fifth alarm for box 69. I have a third alarm for box 8084. I have a third alarm transmitted in Brooklyn with the companies coming to you. I have a second alarm transmitted for box 100. Division 1 want to have more persons reported trapped. I have on the 51st floor, heavy smoke, 5th floor, 6th floor, 9 floor, 4th floor, floor, a pregnant woman's on the 44th floor, 82nd floor, 83rd floor, that's the 6th floor, the 83rd floor, they have 60 to 65 people there. 82nd floor, and also room number 2844. We, we were getting uh, many units responding at the same time, uh, and we had to quickly assign them to different positions. And uh, that's what I was doing, trying to keep the command post uh, organized enough so we knew uh, where people were and where the next assignments had to go. Uh, also, uh, Chief DeRosa, Deputy Chief DeRosa from the 3rd Division responded on the second alarm. Now, we, uh, I assigned Chief DeRosa to take command of the Vista Hotel, which was the uh, original building, the parking lot of the Vista, which we thought was involved. Uh, Chief DeRosa did go to the lobby, and then all the units coming in was uh, sent to the lobby command post for him to uh, then assign uh, to the uh, parking garage or to uh, the uh, floors, 22 floors above, which needed to be searched immediately and evacuated. Uh, we responded into the command post and uh, standing there were uh, civilian employees from the Vista Hotel who were uh, at the moment screaming that there were people still in the hotel. Uh, they weren't sure if they were out. The explosion had occurred underneath the uh, dining area. So uh, we received orders from uh, Division One and uh, to search the hotel. Uh, several units were sent in. We searched the. We were responsible for searching floors number one to seven, along with uh, Engine Company Four. Uh, I'm responding into the uh, lobby. The uh, civilian employees uh, were very cooperative. They uh, they were more than eager to uh, to help us with in a smoke-filled environment. You couldn't see a hand in front of you, and. Uh, they had at the ready, which was very important, the a master key for the uh, for the hotel rooms. That was um, immediately presented to us, along with uh, floor layout plans for the uh, for the upper floors. Uh, we 
With this information and the master key, we responded up to the uh, up through the stairs to the uh, upper floors, searching floors number two through seven, and finding that uh, heavy smoke-filled environment, charged thick black smoke, uh, searching each and every room. Uh, on the seventh, uh, on the fifth floor, uh, it was. Um, we uh, came into the hallway and we heard a, what we thought was, we couldn't believe it, was a woman's voice at the end of the hallway calling feebly for help. Uh, we weren't sure we heard it first, but as we called to her, she called back uh, and we made our way down the hallway and uh, got her out, got her to a, uh, a smoke clear environment through the stairway and uh, she was uh, taken to the street. At the time that the explosion had destroyed the integrity of a, of a wall leading down the ramp that separated the Vista Hotel from Tower One and it also blown out on the first floor some glass that separated the lobby of the hotel from Tower One. This allowed smoke to get into the basement of Tower One into the elevator shafts where doors were blown off and into the stair shafts. Chief Donald Burns responded in pretty shortly after I did. And as I was receiving a report to the smoke, he said he would go into Tower One. Uh, it was only then when I received a report back from Chief Burns that there was smoke down to about uh, five foot level in Tower One, which has ceilings that are probably 40 feet high, that we realized the enormous smoke condition that was involved in there. Uh, immediately transmitted a second alarm, separate second alarm for Tower One. Uh, Chief Burns set up a command post in a the lobby there and just kept requesting units. We responded in and we reported to the command post. And we were told that we would be uh, searching and evacuating elevators starting with the floors, the elevators that served to the lowest floors. So we had to uh, walk up to floor 44 and 47, respectively. 47 would be the elevator machinery room, 44 was where the elevators ended up. Uh, it took us about 25 to 30 minutes to get up to that place after reporting into the command post. And we started uh, searching and uh, the elevators. So what happened was we opened up about four different elevators and uh, when things started, the first three or four elevators the people came out of and they were very happy to see us. Thank you very much. Glad to see you. You know, we've been in there for a while. But what had happened when the elevators started moving, the people thought they were getting out. So they knew something was going, something was happening and they were, someone was looking for them. On the last elevator we did was uh, we opened up the elevator when it was brought to our floor with our forceful entry tools and on the floor of the elevator were 10 people who were down on the elevator. They were, they were unconscious or semi-conscious and we heard no noise. We thought initially we had just discovered 10 bodies stuck in an elevator. And uh, we got those people, we called for an urgent. We got a lot of help. It was amazing the amount of help that showed up. Um, there was a staging area one floor below us. We got firefighters and EMS, people just came up and started helping us. We put our own air masks on these people, and uh, we got these people out of the elevator and got them to start breathing, got them all fresh air. We got into the lobby, Chief Dennehy, I believe he was in the third division, uh, assigned us several tasks. One was to uh, start getting access into the elevators, there were reports of people trapped in elevators in the uh, 70s and in the 50s. And we had a report of a cardiac on the 21st floor. Uh, Fireman Conroy and myself uh, carried a resuscitator up to the 21st floor and uh, administered oxygen and uh, first aid to the uh, cardiac victim. And once uh, she was stabilized, uh, we continued going up. As we were going up, uh, we ensured people that were filtering out of the building that uh, 
conditions were getting a lot better, and uh, as long as they kept moving in the stairways, they'd get out and uh, would be in relative uh, relative safety. In, in the early evening, uh, our mission changed. We were ordered down out of the towers into uh, the area of the explosion, uh, the crater. We utilized uh, a thermal imaging camera and uh, fiber phones, uh, devices we used to uh, pick up sounds and motion and uh, started searching void areas and accessible areas uh, in the lower levels. The fire department would continue searching throughout the night. Members would now get down to the arduous task of removing rubble by hand, literally leaving no stone unturned in an effort to make sure no one was still trapped beneath the debris. Of the six who were killed in the explosion, five would be found within the first two hours, and the sixth not until 17 days later. Over five hours after the blast, Lieutenant Jim Sherwood found 72 people in one elevator, including a class of missing school children. There are 99 elevators in each tower, and they all had to be searched. By the end of the day, 37 chiefs would employ 84 engine companies, 60 ladder companies, and 31 special units. The fire department would remain on the scene for the next 28 days. The cooperation that existed that first day among New York's emergency responders was extended to the many federal and state agencies that now became involved. Operations were moving into a new phase as the government set about finding those responsible. Many fire department personnel would find themselves in the limelight as the media rushed in to cover the event. Many stories of heroism would come to light and many more would never be told, such as the nature of firefighting. For the fire department, it was truly their finest hour. Thousands of people are alive today because of the professionalism and tenacity that was shown in that first hour by New York's bravest. Chief Kenneth Soretta of Manhattan Borough Command said it best. Uh, although much, much deserved credit is being given to those who uh, rescued, removed, and evacuated uh, people from the towers, uh, the key to this entire operation was the extinguishment of the fires in the burning in the, in the sub-basement levels. Without the valiant efforts of these units that operated disregarding uh, the possibility of secondary collapses, uh, secondary explosions, operating in extremely dangerous conditions, the, the smoke condition would have continued, gotten worse, and greatly hampered the efforts of, of the removal operations above. Thank you.